。それでは時間となりましたのでセミナーを開始いたします。本日座長を務めますのは九州大学アジアオセアニア研究教育機構研究推進ディレクターのスコット・バレンタイン教授です。バレンタイン先生よろしくお願いいたします。Great. Thank you, folks. Welcome to today's Brown Bag Seminar. Many thanks、uh, to Dr. Yamaguchi, Dr. Ueda, Dr. Yokota, Ms. Obata, for all of the hard work behind the scenes in, uh, uh, in organizing both this Brown Bag Seminar and all previous ones. Many thanks to our translators today, and a special thanks to those of you who have joined us from wherever you are、uh, to listen to today, today's talk. Today's presenter is、uh, Professor Gerhard Kornatowski. He's an associate professor in the Faculty of Social and Cultural Studies. He's also a graduate from Osaka City University, so a longtime hand here in Japan. His research focuses on inequality and non governmental means of welfare delivery. As such, he's conducted field research in non governmental actors in、uh, Seoul, Taipei, Singapore, and Hong Kong. He's published articles relating to foreign guest houses in Osaka, homelessness and support services in Hong Kong, the migrant communities from Southeast Asia、uh, living in and around Little India in Singapore. So he brings this to all together in today's talk. Entitled Frontiers of Non Exclusionary Urbanism. This extends much of his previous research and focuses on the non governmental provision of care services and inequalities associated with the rise of such provision. So, with that said, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Kornikowski. Thank you, Scott, for that generous introduction.、Um, And let me say it's a real privilege of, of being here and participating in the Brownback series.、Um, let's see, I should share my screen, right?、Um, okay, I hope、uh, you can see the PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay,、um, then let me begin and let me time my talk because I tend to talk a lot, but I'll keep it around、uh, 20 minutes today. So,、um, today's talk, maybe the title is a little bit、uh, ambitious. It's, it's on the frontiers of, of non exclusionary、uh, urbanization. First, I was thinking more in terms of, of inclusionary、um, urbanization, yet, It, it seems to me that we, we need to have a, a little bit of, of new concepts in order to、uh, kind of make sense of, of what the vol voluntary sector is, is doing、um, in cities and, and how they are spatially、um, trying to tackle the issue of、uh, inequality. So that, that's basically the background of my talk today. So we have these two,、uh, two current phenomena. Which one is, is, is inequality and then especially how it manifests itself throughout urban space. So、um, I, I will be focusing a little bit on the spatial patterns of, of inequality in cities. Now, the other thing is the increasing importance of the voluntary sector,、um, especially in advanced,、um, the, well, in advanced、uh, city regions. So they seem to be taking up more and more. Functions which were previously done by the state or which are supposed to be、uh, done by the state, but which are kind of taken over or kind of outsourced to, to、uh, the voluntary sector nowadays. So I'll be also talking a little bit about the social pathways that come,、uh, that emerge from that. And in, in order to connect these spatial patterns and, and social pathways, what I'll be doing is, 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 is focus on、uh, what we call service hubs or service hub neighborhoods, which are conspicuous concentrations of mostly inner city based、uh, voluntary care services and housing resources for vulnerable、uh, populations. So,、um, hold on. So, Today's talk then will be、uh, basically on, on, on the spatiality, also of vulnerable population, and I'll be、uh, mostly focusing on、uh, homeless and, and migrant worker communities for that.、Um, now, the things that I want to discuss today is, is actually 
the issue of, of how the city can accommodate inequality. And, and it might be a little bit trivial. Um, it's not about solving inequality. It's about accommodating inequality. How, how do you deal with uh, inequality? And, and especially within the urban context, um, I think it's it's I think we have been witnessing um, a lot of good elements in urbanization, a lot of bad elements as well as uh, is mentioned in the uh, second quote, being that being the fact that as, as uh, how do we come to terms with this kind of const constant tension between both progressive and regressive moments in urbanization, meaning the good parts. And the bad parts, and 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 how do we look at that as a, as a kind of uh, as a totality, not not as two different um, elements? And that's what kind of the uh, third uh, rep, uh, third quote uh, digs into. I think it's this fact of 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 how do we, well, the fact that urban injustice and things like inequality they coexist, if not sometimes depend on the more service, uh, more supportive responses within urban space. So um, it, it kind of becomes important to, to look at urban injustice or inequality and the good elements, the supportive responses as kind of both, uh, as kind of two sides of the same coin. And in, in order to look at the, those two sides of the coin, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit, I'll be uh, focusing more on urbanism and, and, and what kind of urbanism actually supportive responses produce and how that becomes uh, basically enshrined within the urbanization uh, process. So today's talk will be a lot on, uh, on the social relation and the actual kind of built environment they use or the built environment they uh, produce. So in order to, to make sense of, of these, that kind of double side of, of the same coin, uh, I'll be first going a little bit more into urban theory and especially uh, critical urban theory and how urban theory has, uh, how, how it has uh, basically um, tried to engage with the issue of uh, inequality. So that, that, that will kind of uh, become uh, the generality of, of today's talk. Uh, now, in order to uh, talk a little bit more about the actual stuff that is happening uh, within cities. I'll be uh, talking also a little bit of the features of the voluntary sector and their geographies and how that connects uh, to their uh, activities within service hub neighborhoods. So this will be more about the, the chaotic uh, types of, of, of activities they're doing, the types of care they're uh, trying to uh, provide. So that, that, that will be focusing more uh, on the particularities. And in order to illustrate that, I'll, I'll, I'll provide some experiences on the ground and I'll, I'll try to frame that within the context of uh, advanced East Asian city, reason, uh, city regions before I reach the conclusion in which I want to discuss a little bit more the kind of spatial politics that come out of, of, of forms of non-inclusionary urbanism. And I hope to connect that with, with a kind of theory of, of, of urban uh, inclusivity. So first, um, on to critical urban theory. Um, so I think critical urban theory has, uh, has basically struggled with the question of what is the nature of capitalist urbanization? Meaning, what is the nature of a type of urbanization that operates within uh, under the imperative of economic growth? And they're all kind of uh, theories on that, but what comes out of that, that is that urbanization is basically, it becomes one of the spatial, it becomes the spatial backdrop of growth. It is a outlet for uh, productive investment. And, and that's also something that uh, cities compete for. So uh, a lot of economic growth emerges from the built environment. It emerges from urbanization. It's basically urbanization is a profitable activity. And um, I, I like this graph that I've put on uh, this slide uh, showing, it, it shows all these kind of uh, points in time when different cities uh, kind of spectacularly increased their GDP per capita. And if, if you look at those dates, what that, uh, what that collides with is actually the start of big urbanization processes in, in those countries. So uh, we have USA in this graph, uh, showing around the 1930s when we have the, the kind of third wave, uh, the first waves of suburban, suburbanization in, in the USA. 
Uh, in the UK, that's more of a kind of steady uh, increase, uh, which followed the, the old kind of industrial basis that was present in the UK. Uh, in Japan, you can see that it, it really kicks off in the 1950s. That's when Tokyo comes up. That's when the whole Kanto uh, region starts uh, urbanizing. Uh, now for China, it's also interesting. Um, after the 1980s, when they opened up their economy, what they start doing is, is immediately uh, initiate big rounds of, of, of urbanization. Uh, so you kind of can see the connection of, of, of how urbanization and economic growth go hand in hand. But of course, if that goes hand in hand, that means that it produces a particular space. It produces something that is conducive to uh, economic growth. And it's, it's interesting to think of this uh, nowadays in terms of maps. So originally we, we, we kind of, th this is a model from already uh, almost 100 years ago on the left, uh, which was the kind of uh, initial view on cities as this kind of um, urban centers that gradually start growing, right? In, in this kind of concentric form. Uh, when we enter into the post-war era, we, we, we see kind of cities converging into each other, kind of have these extensions forming um, these kind of metropolis regions. And nowadays we, we, we rather tend to think as, as, as cities uh, in connection to each other. This is what we mean with the global city nowadays. So it's interesting to see that this, this whole uh, tract of economic growth of, of kind of capital accumulation through urbanization also changes uh, within the, uh, the cartographic uh, moments that are shown on these maps. Which brings us to the question, when we talk about cities, at what scale, or at what scale are we looking at them? And often we would like to think about the importance of cities in terms of how much population lives there, but it's not really about that. And that's what Batman is trying to uh, make Robin understand that it's not just about the amount of population that is in, in cities, it, it's, it's, it's about the, the kind of patterns how cities grow. It's about the new types of uh, lifestyle that produces. It's about the kind of also the uneven development it brings with it. There's so much more to urbanization as to just the amount of populations uh, living in cities. Which brings us to the issue of uh, inequality. And, 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 and here is where critical urban theory really kind of digs into the problematics of, of capitalist urbanization. Um, actually saying that urban growth under a capitalist urbanization project has to be uneven. It has to be uneven because growth is all about capitalizing on still undervalued opportunities. Meaning that if there are no gaps, there are no opportunities. So the whole process of urbanization cannot be even. There is always one place of the investments which capital locks into, but because of the fact that it locks into one place means that it kind of deserts another place. So we kind of have this pendulum of investment and deinvestment uh, within uh, urban cities. And I've just put up this illustration in the slides here. So if you want to look at it, if you want to look at the uh, at the Japanese context. On the left, we have, this is the 1960s, right? We, we have all the investments flowing in, into the suburbs of, of Japanese cities, building these large, these large uh, housing estates. Nowadays, we have capital coming back and, and I've put up this, uh, this map of Fukuoka city. And because the map is very good, it shows what is happening in the city. And it also shows how capital is basically returning uh, into the city. And, and it, it's kind of interesting to look at, at what kind of projects they're doing in those places. And you will quickly notice that a lot of those projects are all about, okay, how, how do we sustain or how do we realize the next rounds of economic growth? And, and then you go back to the suburban areas and all of a sudden you see all these former new towns kind of decaying, uh, becoming like depressed areas. And, and you, kind of, you kind of see how investment kind of shifts its way uh, through uh, the urban context. So you might imagine that the next round, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, will go back into uh, the suburban spaces. But this is what I mean with this kind of uh, unequal, this um, kind of uneven uh, pattern of, of, of uh, 
uh, of urbanization that we see in, in, in uh, city regions. So we, we have all these kind of interesting manifestations emerging from that. And I think the picture here shows it very well, very well, although it's a picture from a South American city, it kind of shows how, you know, the, the kind of type of inequality, uneven development, uh, the kind of contrast that uh, provides uh, within our uh, cityscape. But the interesting question here to ask is, is the fact that, okay, where has investment not happened? Wh which Places have been left out, which, which are the kind of left behind spaces in the cities. And those are the spaces that I'll be uh, basically focusing uh, upon uh, from now. But an important thing to, 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 to realize or, or to know at this point is the fact that if we have this kind of unequal form of urbanization, and because we also have an unequal form of society, then, then how are these kind of left behind spaces used? And, and here I will be focusing on the term of surplus uh, populations. Surplus population, th those are populations who are surplus to this kind of uh, capitalistic uh, urbanization um, kind of progress that we see this, it's kind of people that cannot enter into that kind of mainstream uh, urbanization and who make their own type of spaces within the city. Now for this picture, you can see the slum areas, but um, it, 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 it comes in different forms. Uh, this is a picture of Osaka, but you can kind of see the contrast of, of the kind of uh, this kind of profit-based uh, urbanization, which you see in the background of this picture and of kind of the inner city spaces that kind of left out of that urbanization project. And it, it, it creates these, these very uh, interesting contrasts. Now, of course, depending on which city you're in, um, these, the form of those contrasts will be different. Um, okay, I need to hurry up a, a, a little bit, I've noticed. So, and, and here's where we come to the features of the voluntary uh, sector, um, which kind of, the, the, these sectors try to, of course, they try to take care of the surplus populations. Now, normally I get a lot of flack for this term sur uh, surplus populations, but I think it's important to define them as a population that kind of cannot be easily um, uh, kind of integrated within the capitalist order and, and who have their kind of own rhythm. So they don't really have the capacity for, for, for productivity, meaning that they cannot really do normal jobs. Although they are able to do jobs, it's, it's just at a different rhythm, basically. But what tends to happen if the city is, is a kind of, uh, this kind of outcome of, of uneven development, this is where we also, um, when we also, uh, where we also meet issues of, of segregations. And we've been looking at segregations a lot in terms of slums, urban decay, ghettos, disadvantaged areas, but this is mainly on the form. What I want to uh, kind of focus on is not the form, but it's the spatial functionality. Well, what do these ghettos do? What do these slums do? And in order to do that, I will use the term uh, service hub, which are actually those left out neighborhoods where, which are now inhabited by voluntary sector or, or organizations and by certain uh, surplus populations. And um, because of lack of time, I will only be uh, focusing on the build environment of the service hub, but it's important to see the service up in, in, in this kind of sets of, of social relations. It's social relations based on issues like poverty, uh, exclusion, uh, inequality, and they, they have their own, their own type of layering to it. So there is a lot of professional care services available. There are also uh, a lot of unprofessional uh, care services available. It, it's just kind of different layers, different kind of people doing different kind of things. That's what makes it kind of a chaotic uh, space as well. But what is important here that it is a space of unre uh, unreciprocated care. It's, it's a space of, and, and this is where it differs from social bonds. It's not really based on this feeling of a community. No, it's based on motivation of wanting to care. It's about wanting to care. People who work in the care uh, service sector, most of them, especially them who provide voluntary services, they really have the urge to care. And it's that kind of motivation that becomes the, the social basis of this area. Um, but. You also have to know that it's a place of transience. So there's a high turnover of people 
because there is a high turnover of people, we, we, most of the time we don't know what is happening because we don't know what is happening. We have that kind of, of uh, that, that feeling of stigmatization attached to it as well, because it's, it's a lot of strange people, a lot of people who kind of not fit within mainstream society, they kind of flow uh, through these um, areas. But that is the important thing. It's a kind of entry and exit point of surplus population. Now, if you look at that in terms of statistic, it, it looks like a poor neighborhood, but that doesn't mean that it's not functioning. It's about poor people entering that place and leaving that place after kind of graduating from that place after receiving services. But as soon as one leaves that place, the next poor person is waiting. And, and, and that's why it looks like a poor area, but actually it, it might be very functional in, in, in what they're doing. But uh, also, and, and I think this is important, we have to look at these spaces as coping matrices. They try to cope with a problem. They try to cope with uh, the issue of inequality. So they're not really solutions to inequality yet. They try to kind of uh, make the impact of inequality more bearable. Um, so and I'll, I'll just show some uh, experiencing uh, experiences from on the ground from Hong Kong and, and, and Singapore, and I'll do this quickly. Um, so for Hong Kong, I've been looking at, at homeless uh, care services. Uh, mostly in, in, in a place called Sham Shui Po, which is in the Red Circle, which is located right outside of the uh, city center. Now, Hong Kong is a place with extremely high housing prices, which means that rehousing uh, homeless persons is not an easy job to do. Um, there's also a lot of uh, urban renewal going around in these places. So this is what the city center looks like. But once you go behind the city center, you kind of get into a, a much different um, reality. And, and, and the topic nowadays is all about uh, the housing issue and, and the topic of subdivided units, uh, where they subdivide existing um, apartments into much more smaller rooms uh, is, is now a big topic. They're calling it butchered cubicles right now. But th these are the kind of only places which um, which kind of which the service populations uh, can enter. And it's these kind of forms of housing, it's type of marginal type of housing, but they can become part of the service hub. These become part of care services because it's the only accessible form of housing that exists. Although these are just some uh, pictures of, of the kind of uh, redevelopment pressures that are happening, but the voluntary sector also needs to adapt to this new situation, but you, you see, uh, especially the voluntary sector in Hong Kong trying to uh, connect to landlords uh, who kind of provide the spaces for their services uh, for free. Um, these are the type of, of, of regeneration projects that the NGOs are doing. So there is always this problem of space in, in Hong Kong yet it's about this kind of ingenuity, how bad housing conditions in small spaces can still be uh, kind of flipped over and improved um, as these pictures show. I don't have time, uh, enough time to go into the actual comments, but you, you, can, you can see how surplus population, how the users of those services think about. And, and, and again, it's this uh, element of temporality that comes to it. Having this kind of good temporal solution, it's a temporal solution in order to get uh, basically back on their feet. Um, for Singapore, I've been doing that same, uh, same thing. So I'll be, I've been looking at these spaces, uh, Little India and Geelang, which are also located just outside of the city center and how, they, how these areas provide services for uh, migrant workers. So this is the city center of Singapore. Yet if you go behind that city center, you have this completely different space. Uh, again, you have the, this, kind of similar housing resources that are available, but you need to walk around those neighborhoods because those um, apartments or bath spaces are not advertised in, 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 in regular uh, real estate offices. And, and these are kind of the cultural preserved landscapes in Singapore and, and on, on the ground floor, you will have all these commercial um, 
businesses, but it's interesting what is happening on the second floor, because again, we see here, here we see this kind of subdivision of, of, of apartments, uh, this subdividing of apartments uh, happening. And again, it, this is the only resource that migrant workers who come to the city center for care services, uh, these are the only housing uh, resources that they can uh, access. Then we also have these uh, interesting public spaces available. Um, th there's a lot of issues of, of how do you govern these populations. So you see a lot of more, a, a lot of monitoring, uh, a lot of these kind of new CCTV, uh, CCTV cameras, a lot of new uh, light poles that that cannot, uh, which you cannot put on these advertisement for bad space apartments on it anymore. So, so this is uh, how these spaces are also kind of changing and how the NGO sector also address that. So how do they connect with, with the government and, and how do, do they try to navigate with, uh, through all these new uh, realities? So uh, I think my time's up, but what I kind of wanted to work to, uh, to is, is when we talk about these kind of urbanisms that emerge from, from, these, non uh, from these voluntary care uh, activities is that we have to look more at the actual type of placemaking they, they, they make. So I've already mentioned the motivations why the sector wants to care for surplus population, but it's also how they make use of the builder environment. It's also how they upgrade the uh, build environment for themselves and according to the actual social needs that are present uh, in these uh, areas. And to conclude, um, you may have noticed that I didn't use any language of that these are alternative spaces or that these are kind of commons and a new form of commons or different spaces. No, they are part of parcel of capitalist urbanization. It, it, it kind of um, sustains this process of, of, of kind of the spectacular forms of urbanization uh, that we have. And through these forms, we, we can still have these spaces that have the potentiality of becoming these spaces of, of, of basically of, of urban uh, inclusivity. Sorry, I think I talked too long, so I'll, I'll keep it here. Thank you. <clears throat> I, would, I wouldn't say you talked too long. It was it was just right. Um, can I encourage those of you who are in the virtual audience to please post any questions or comments that you might have in the chat box? Um, Professor Yokota asks uh, asks a question um, uh, in in regard to best practice, and he's he's asking what what cities would you consider um, to be exemplary. Uh, in terms of creating a, or, or uh, I should say, accommodating inequality the best. Um, well, each city has the, has the, has their own basically their own niches, their own specialities. They they have their own surplus populations. I mean, uh, the issue, for example, of migrant workers in 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 Singapore, you will not quite find in another place because one third of the population in Singapore is a migrant worker nowadays, right? So th these are the kind of realities that cities adapt to. And you can find good practices uh, anywhere, but eventually what you need to start looking into is, is, is how much does the state uh, support th those activities? You know, what, what is the relation between the voluntary sector and the, uh, and, and, and the state, but the public sector, basically? It, it, it's also the kind of, of, of resources, local resources that um, these voluntary agencies can, um, can, can get their hands on uh, within the city. So, but I think the interesting thing, the interesting question we need to ask here is, is, is if, if, the, if we have problems with inequality, does that mean that we need to look or look for a solution or, or for this kind of coping mechanism in terms of segregation or not, because people tend to be very wary against segregation and the kind of concentrations of poverty. Yet, if you look at the voluntary sector, this is where they can do their thing and, and they have their own space and they can effectively organize their own services in, in that space. And it's difficult for me to say which city does the best job to that. You kind of need to look at each city. I think each city has has the kind of good points and bad points to it. Um, you know, given given your research in the past and your experience, um, you know, uh, viewing Fukuoka City or even Itoshima City, 
Um, are, are there any suggestions that you think um, could be made to municipal authorities, either in Fukuoka or Itoshima? Uh, yeah, um, so for Fukuoka, I'm, I'm not that uh, specialized in the case of uh, Fukuoka yet, but uh, uh, when you talk about, for example, if you look into the homeless issue in, in Fukuoka, you will see that the homeless issue has improved drastically over the last 10 to 15 years. And that has also to do with a lot of goodwill of, of the public sector. It's uh, Fukuoka it has kind of very strong public sector and, and a quite uh, accessible welfare system, which has uh, been very uh, helpful to the actual um, support agencies that also operate within, um, within Fukuoka city. So it's, it has been easy to get homeless people to uh, livelihood benefits. And, and this is where the kind of voluntary sector takes over. So they have that, that income although it's welfare benefits, but they have that income. And then it becomes a question, okay, where can we rehouse them? And then this is where the voluntary sector then has their own connections to the private housing market and, and, you know, and landlords that are willing to rent these spaces to, to, to former homeless people. Because normally uh, landowners, they, 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 they are very kind of, they, they wanna back down from that issue because you know, there are so many people living in an apartment and, what happens if a ex-homeless people enter that apartment? It, it's always a, a difficult issue, but it's how the voluntary sector can navigate through that that, that, that makes it uh, very effective, I think. And in the case of Fukuoka, I think that has been working quite well. Now, there is still homelessness in Fukuoka, but there's just so many organizations that are doing so many things right now, uh, which, which uh, I wanna look more into actually. When we when we talk about critical urban studies, um, so these three these three terms: equality, fairness, justice. Mm -hmm. Which do you feel should be prioritized when trying to evaluate coverage for um, you know welfare services? Um. Yeah, here, here. Well, it's 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 not an easy question actually, but I think here the term justice uh, comes to mind because if we're talking about the welfare system, the welfare system is a is a is a national system here, right? And it should be accessible by everyone. Everybody has, uh, everybody is eligible to access welfare if you have citizenship. That is, of course, yet. It doesn't, it, it, that's not the reality. And there are a lot of homeless uh, care services that take care of homeless people who have just not been able to claim their benefits for all sorts of reasons. Maybe, you know, some, some city uh, government may feel that, no, this person should not be on, on welfare benefits. He should work, and, but eventually he cannot work. So you, you have all these people that kind of fall through the safety net, right? And then this is where the problem of justice comes, comes up, I think. Normally they should have been able to access welfare. They haven't been able to access, this, access uh, welfare. And, and, and okay, and this is, uh, this is where you enter the voluntary uh, organization sector because they kind of mop up this problem and, 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 and try to, to provide their own services. But through those services, they can reconnect to the public sector because they have a bigger voice. They can lobby. They can do many things. They they have more uh, resources to them. So, I, I think that, yeah, it's it's this kind of uh, ju uh, justice. It's it's kind of justice issue. I think that 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 relates. And and critical urban studies has been working a lot on this idea of 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 urban justice, spatial justice, not just social justice, right? What kind of people? What kind of places uh, can people access within the city? Because the the less money you have, the less spaces you can access within the city. So, okay, how do we solve that? And how do we make it more just? And this is also about accommodating inequality. How do you give a chance to to basically lower class population? How how, how do you make sure they can access every place they need to access within the city? So. This is where the concept of, 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 of justice, spatial justice, uh, social justice has uh, been quite popular within critical urban studies. Thank you. Um, you you've, um, 
you you had a there there's an interesting question about the SDGs because you know there there are there are targets for achieving or for reducing inequality. So the question is, um, you know, by 2030, given the amount of infrastructure that is already in place, what, what do you think? How how much urban inequality can be reduced in such a short period of time? Um, well, it's, uh, this is uh, this is quite difficult because we're talking about inequality, right? It's it's it, that's different from poverty. I can understand the SDG on poverty because that's about absolute poverty, lifting people out of poverty. But as we still, we, as we live in an unequal society, there will always be inequality, right? And so the question is, how much of that inequality do do you want to to to, to kind of uh, fill up? And I think here, so I, I have today I've only talked about kind of the downside of inequality, but of course there's also an upper side to inequality. And this is where we need more politics to it. Uh, I think one of the recent topics right now is this idea of basic income, right? Giving people basic income, and this is how we can uh, decrease the gap of inequality. But actually we should also be thinking about a, a ceiling for a maximum income. And, 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 you know, the type of, uh, and then the resources that you can get from there. So it, it becomes important to see at, okay, what kind of politics do you want to strive for on both ends of the, of the inequality issue? I think the SDGs have been focusing a little bit too much on, on the downside. Of, of inequality, it should look more to the to the upper side as well. But this is where we enter into a very politically uh, delicate question, right? So this is why we also need more politics uh, to it, I think. Professor Tanaka is asking, um, you know, when you choose the case studies, um, you know, for your research, well, are there any criteria that you use to, you know, to spark? the search for a, a given municipality for example he says why, why do you choose osaka and not paris or or hong kong and not london um the reason for me to uh, choose singapore and hong kong is because they are uh, two of the most unequal societies in the world and if we want to come to terms with issues like urban injustice or or or, or neoliberalism or this very kind of exclusionary form of urbanization or, or, or just, you know, very anti-welfare uh, type of, 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 of context, then I think first we should look at those two places uh, because it's interesting that they have always had these kind of low levels of welfare, but because of that, you see a, a, a kind of voluntary sector emerging and, and kind of questioning you know, the, the, that context and, and trying to kind of tackle the issue. So my reason for, for Singapore and Hong Kong is because I think we can learn a lot from the kind of, especially for the current kind of global um, economic ideology that we're in, especially, you know, with neoliberalization, with this idea that the market should be doing more, not the government. That's what Singapore and Hong Kong have been doing right from the start. It, it always has been kind of, uh, you know, people have to survive within uh, within the market, and and that, that's why I focus on these. But of course, I'm also very interested in the East Asian context. Um, when we look at service hub in Western context, we notice that these are often residues of the Keynesian era when state support was very big. This we didn't have in East Asia. So it, it kind of becomes a very interesting question as, as if there wasn't this kind of welfare residue that uh, the voluntary sector could emerge of, then, then how did they emerge? Why did they emerge? And, and why did they emerge there? I think that's a very interesting question to ask uh, within the uh, East Asian uh, context. So that's why I also tend to focus on places like Osaka, which is in this slide. This is Osaka on the slide, right? And, and, but also places like Taipei and Seoul, because eventually they, there are a lot of similarities between what is happening. It's, it's not only about the differences, it's about the similarities and, and, and how you, well, what you can learn from those similarities, basically. The, um, I, I mean, Hong Kong in particular is an interesting one and it, it kind of sparks a question that I had because when, 
uh, it's not unusual, um, you know, to have a, you know, a thousand square foot apartment mm -hmm. in Hong Kong that costs goju man uh, per month. And, um, you know, so really the, you know, the, the uh, homelessness that that exists there, and the and the housing problems that exist there, are largely um, a a factor of just government failure. You know they haven't you know uh, you know taken adequate public land uh, in reserve to provide housing for people in convenient places, and that's why they talk about housing that is just so far away from public transport that it makes it unreasonable. So I, I guess my question is, um, so is there a correlation in the work that you've done? Is there a correlation between um, the rise of non-governmental provision of welfare services and government failure to provide such services? Um, yeah. Uh, so one interesting aspect of the voluntary sector is the fact that they don't only provide care services, they also do advocacy. They also do that. Right. And, and this is what you notice in, in places like Hong Kong and Singapore. Well, not much that in Singapore because um, NGOs, uh, the NGO sector in Singapore is quite small and the government in Singapore is quite strong. It, it, there's no real freedom of speech in Singapore. So that makes it kind of difficult to do advocacy in, in, in Singapore, although many organizations have their have their own way of getting around that but in uh, but hong kong has been very vocal and a lot of movements and i think the interesting thing for the uh for the house for the homeless service organization is is the, the type of um pathway they had up until now so around the 2000s when we had the imf crisis when all of a the sudden there was this explosion of the homeless issue in hong kong uh, what do you see that sector do? It, it tries to get jobs because the economic crisis, uh, a lot of jobs were lost. So they go to the government, hey, you guys need to help out. We need more jobs. And through jobs, people can get a salary. Through that salary, they can get into housing. Now, that problem is kind of solved around 2010. But what happens? You have the housing crisis in, in Hong Kong. Everything gets too expensive. So even if you have a salary, you cannot get into housing. So you see that they switch to this uh, movement of rent control. We should have rent control in order to make sure people can still access housing. Now that fails again. Recently, what you see happening is actually, it, it kind of move away from advocacy and, and, and focus more on prag a pragmatic solution. So one of the uh, pictures on social housing is actually a result of that. It's about, Knowing that even if you complain to the government, they will really they won't really solve the problem. So it becomes up to us. And let's put our energy into providing solutions, even if they're temporal solutions, and not putting all our energy into advocacy or 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 or, or this kind of uh, social movements anymore. So I think, yeah, th these are the kind of things you you see in in in, in Hong Kong, of course. But yeah, actually, it's like you said, it's it's about the uh, the land regime in Hong Kong, and the land all the land is owned by Hong Kong government, right? So th this is where critical urban study comes back into because land is the main income resources for Hong Kong. It's their it's their source of growth, right? And that makes it so difficult to, to kind of you know step out of that uh, existing uh, land regime in order to provide more affordable housing or whatever because you cannot really do that. If you do that, it means that you're 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 going to tinkle with growth and nobody wants to tinkle with growth, right? So that's the type of uh, contradictions that that the sector finds itself in Hong Kong, I would say. Professor Kornatowski, thank you for a very interesting, thought-provoking discussion today. Um, I, I feel that I could probably do this for another hour, just uh, chatting about these uh, interesting uh, research challenges. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, My pleasure. Those of you who have dialed in, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, please hold on just for one minute so that we can, um, we've got a, a, just a very brief survey and also a flyer for next week's talk. So I'll hand this over to uh, Dr. Yamaguchi and uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you.
この後、月先生、えー、バレンタイン先生、ありがとうございました。最後に事務局より2点ご案内させていただきます。まず、次回のブラウンバックセミナーのご案内です。次回は来週8月4日水曜日の12月12時10分より、えー、九州大学熱帯農学研究センターの百村紀彦准教授より、えー、新食品素材マイナーサブシステンスとしての昆虫食、昆虫食は人類を救うのかと題し、講演を実施いたします。詳細はホームページをご覧ください。